So, so this talk is about uh, Expo, which is a little bit of a um, switch from kind of what you guys were just talking about, which is kind of like native plugins and deploying native code versus you know JavaScript updates. And um, but it does tie in because you mentioned about push, uh, code push, which is which will tie into some things that I'm going to talk about here in a moment. So I'm Simon. I'm a software engineer, uh, a founder, uh, React Native enthusiast. So I I worked at Facebook back in 2013, 2014, 2015, which is when um, it was really at a, a, a a time when uh, React was super exciting and React Native was like just becoming a thing. Uh, so internally, it was called Catalyst at that time. And then I was there back in early 2015 when they announced it to the public. And we were all surprised at the new name. The new name had been like decided by a marketing team. And they're like, we're going to call this thing React Native. And, um, and then it was announced to the world. So anyway, that was kind of a tumultuous time too because React Native was a mess back then. It was an unpolished product to go to open source. Anyway, so um, and then more recently, I worked at Google on the YouTube product infrastructure team. And this is my uh, Twitter handle on the right. There's an underscore at the end there, but feel free to, my, my DMs are open. You can always sh uh, shout out at me on, on Twitter. Okay, so uh, I'm here today to talk to you about Expo. And um, you're probably wondering, or you might be wondering, what is Expo? Hopefully everybody in this group knows what Expo is, but I do just want to quickly mention uh, what Expo is. Or maybe even another way of thinking about it is like, what does it have to do with React Native, right? A lot of people are asking like, what is the difference between Expo and React Native? Is it part of React Native? Is it an add-on? Or you know why would I use it? And so Expo is essentially a set of tooling for React Native. And so the way I like to think of it is like it's all the stuff that should be in React Native Core but isn't, right? And so React Native Core has been going kind of down the pathway of being more lean. So they're pulling stuff out of React Native Core. So they pulled out maps. They pulled out async storage. They pulled out a bunch of things out of the, the kind of core. Expo has been doing the opposite and just, just packing amazing uh, features and things into their sort of product. Now, I know that doesn't tell you exactly what it is, but you can think of it as like a set of tooling. And But really, it's much more than that. So it's a set of, like, for example, there's build services that are, that are connected up with Expo. There's kind of this scaffolding piece for creating new projects. There's web support, which is uh, something that was not at all on the radar of the core React Native team at all. Um, there's this online playground called Snack, which hopefully you all have tried. It's really cool for doing small repro cases, things like that, um, demos, learning. Um, and then it comes with this app runner thing, which is like this, this app that you install from the app store on your phone, and it kind of runs your code as you're developing, or um, even you, you can kind of like uh, publish previews and things through that, which is great. So it's a bunch of stuff. Um, and so, you know, interestingly, I gave this talk or, you know, a, a similar talk about Expo at uh, Singapore JavaScript back in 2017, which was like three and a half years ago now. And uh, it was so new at that time because, I mean, React Native was, was even kind of new at that time, but Expo had been called Exponent up until that point. So, like, when I had put that talk in, it was called Exponent. And then while I was preparing the talk, it, they switched to calling it Expo. So they were still kind of like solidifying what they're calling this thing and what exactly their goals were and everything. And so, um, you know, I look back at this and I was like kind of a, maybe a fanboy of Expo back then. And I was like, guys, listen, no, there's this thing and it's super new and it's cool and you guys got to try it and, and it's amazing. And and everybody was just kind of like, yeah, look, you know, I don't know. And, and then I think the people who did try it in those early days were probably let down a little bit. Like, unless you were as excited uh, as me about it, people who, like, if you tried Expo probably, you know, t before, uh, like, 2019, then you were probably like, wow, this thing is really rough around the edges, and maybe it's okay for, like, some quick demos, but it's really not a polished product. And so the reason I bring this up is because when I look back at, like, what I was presenting in this talk back then, and, and I look at what we have now with Expo, it has improved a lot. So Expo has really changed for the better. So I would encourage you to give Expo another shot. If you haven't in the last three and a half years, uh, it's changed a lot. So um, anyway, that's not what you came here to hear. Uh, you came here to talk about uh, these 10 things. And so these are in no particular order. I do hope that I land on some things that you don't already know. And I wish I had like a way to pull you and find out like if I'm teaching, if I'm showing you anything new or that you didn't know, because I know it was like almost like a clickbaity title of like 10 things you didn't know you could do, but I definitely think we're gonna hit a few things that you probably didn't know you could do, or at least I hope so. Uh, number one. Uh, so uh, this I think is, is maybe not super groundbreaking and maybe doesn't apply to everybody in here, but, but I thought it was interesting, which is that you can, all of a sudden you can build for iOS without a Mac. And this is something that uh, really affects a large portion of the world because not everybody in the world has access to a Mac, especially outside of the Bay Area or outside of the US. Um, and so uh, this is really the first, Expo was really the first time, um, well, you know, besides web technologies, that, that people could build these native apps uh, for iOS without a Mac. And there are certainly a lot of people even 
um, within the U.S. That, that have iPhones, but they don't uh, necessarily have a Mac as their daily driver. So, so this unlocks a lot of possibilities for people, which I thought was really cool. And how does that work? Uh, so you code your app on you know, Windows or Linux or Chromebook or whatever, and then you would preview on your physical iPhone, right? So, so Expo has this ability to kind of like push the JavaScript across the, the network or the Wi-Fi onto your device. So you preview on your phone, and then when you're ready to kind of like build this thing, you use Expo's build servers. And so that uh, can be done at the command line or it can be done through your CI CD pipeline, which is definitely the way to do it. And then lastly, like when you're ready to go, you deploy to Test Flight or to the App Store. And there's a little asterisk there because, yes, technically you do have to have um, a Mac to do that, or you have to do that last step that, like, there's a command that's built in just to literally upload the IPA from your computer to the App Store or to the, the it's called App Store Connect, and it has to be done from a Mac because, I don't know, whatever, it's, um, that's an Apple thing. But, uh, but anyway, the reason why I put an asterisk there is because it is possible if you don't have a Mac to do that as part of your CI CD pipeline. So I know with Circle CI you can do it. I think with GitHub Actions you can do it. Um, so I th so it, even that last step I think is possible without having a Mac workstation. So anyway, I, th I thought that was kind of an interesting point. Uh, now, item number two you could build a completely offline app. And so this may seem obvious, or maybe it's something you don't think a lot about uh, because most uh, mobile devices are online. But if you think about, you know, I mean, like what would a completely offline app look like? I don't know, note-taking app or to-do list or reminders or Pomodoro timers, things like that. But, um, but one interesting thing, app that I really like that, that surprised me how many times, uh, like I've been on an airplane and this app works offline so well is WhatsApp, right? So WhatsApp, uh, works where all the messages are completely stored in the images and the videos and everything on your device. You can search, you can query, you can even send a message while you're like in airplane mode and it'll just kind of you know send that message through when you're back online again. So um, I, I do think offline apps can be done right. Um, it's kind of the no network, no problem thing. And so with um, React Native, you'd have to piece together a bunch of parts, but Expo gives you this stuff out of the box. And so when I say this stuff, I mean like a full-blown uh, SQLite database that you can store as much stuff in, you know, query it, like all the kind of stuff you would expect from a real database. Uh, file storage, right? Images, it, like you can store images, you can manipulate images, like image manipulation and stuff is built in, encryption, uh, even just authentication, right? So you get the, the biometric, like the face recognition, the fingerprint, don't need a network connection for that. Um, and even local notification, you, get, you can receive push notifications even if you're completely nowhere near a network connection because you can schedule these. Uh, and, and this is very new, by the way, this just got released. So I thought that was really cool to include in this talk. Um, and so a lot of really powerful, what I would consider like offline support is now baked into Expo. So uh, item number three, so uh, you can build for web, which I assume a lot of you have probably already know, but you can also build desktop apps with Expo. And so, uh, you know, you may already know that Expo supports web, but did you know that like in the web support, we have uh, camera support, QR code scanning, uh, gesture handler, right? Like in web, I thought that was really cool. Um, things like dark mode support, image manipulation, accelerometer, I've seen games built with Expo Web. Um, so, you know, web really has this kind of first class support right out of the box with uh, Expo. And, and I thought that was, um, uh, even though that may not be the most, you know, hid, kept secret in the Expo community, I think people don't really understand how much has happened in the web support uh, space recently with, with Expo. But, um, but the second part of this point is that, uh, because you can build for web and you have this thing called Electron which puts web on, uh, on desktop apps, you can actually build desktop apps with Expo and people are doing this. And it, I was really surprised at how easy this is. You just like run this simple command. It's officially supported by the Expo folks. So, so this was the announcement blog article from Evan Bagan. And it's, uh, you know, like, you know, Evan has pushed a lot of web stuff forward or this kind of what they consider universal app stuff forward with, with Expo. And it's just, it's getting so good uh, to the point where you kind of just run this command and you're building, you're building uh, uh, desktop apps. Now, I know there's a lot of hate in the world for Electron because it is kind of heavy and everything because uh, it does kind of wrap web tech in a Chromium type environment. Um, and there is some other alternatives out there uh, from Microsoft for building native desktop apps using React Native that, that doesn't use um, Electron, but this is uh, definitely, I, I thought, something that maybe people don't realize you can do with Expo. Right, so uh, number four, uh, PR, pull request, deploy previews. And deploy previews go by a lot of names, but um, I have heard them called this. The idea is this. So you get a pull request and you're working on an on a Expo app or a React Native app, and you've, you've built some feature and the person reviewing your 
uh, your code wants to preview it, right? They want to open it, run it on their device. So they'd have to like download the app and you know typically like build it in Xcode and do all this like uh, this huge amount of setup and steps and everything. Whereas like with uh, Expo uh, deploy previews and, and this particular GIF here on the left is actually from um, a project called uh, Shipper which is from Formidable Labs, and it's a couple of years old, and there's a newer one out there as well. But there's there's multiple ways of doing this, but the idea is that right there on the pull request, you have this little QR code or this link, scan it with your phone, you're immediately kind of running it on your device. And um, it's possible with Expo because Expo allows you, like everything about your app, all the business logic is in JavaScript, so it can kind of be shipped over the network to your device, so that's really cool. Um, has anybody, did anybody already know this, this, this stuff exists or this PR kind of previews, this capability exists? I don't know if I'm telling you guys stuff that you already know. We got one thumbs up. Okay, cool. Um, number five. So uh, shared element transitions. So this is an interesting one because a lot of you may either not know what that is or like why would I care and what do shared elements have to do with anything. Um, so this is the concept of kind of as you navigate around the app that a, a given kind of element kind of just morphs into a new element on a new screen. And so this is like the, the canonical example here, um, which is that you kind of click on a post and it kind of morphs into at least the image and the, the text and kind of morph into the full version of the details view of that, of that uh, item. Um, a better example, I think, would be uh, from this this person named Catalin, who's been like really active in the community of just kind of like uh, 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 he, he runs a bunch of um, uh, courses. He has a YouTube channel, so definitely worth checking out. And so this is just an example that that he has a tutorial on, um, which is uh, in, in fact he has a tutorial for all of these different examples of how you can do these amazing shared uh, element experiences. I think a lot of people probably don't realize this is possible, at least in any smooth way, with React Native, and and probably don't realize that it's possible with, or that it's baked in, comes out of the box in Expo. So these are really cool shared element transitions. Uh, I totally recommend going and checking out um, Catalin and his content on YouTube and on his GitHub. So, uh, and then he um, gives you, I, I think you can get access, you have to back him on, on Patreon to get access to some of his uh, premium content. But anyway, really, uh, really cool that this concept of shared elements is baked into Expo. And uh, when you combine that with reanimated, you can build some really immersive experiences with this. Number six, so uh, SVG and Lottie. So SVG is probably nothing new to you, uh, but uh, one of my favorite tricks about SVG uh, that, that kind of people don't necessarily realize when building React Native is that the default way to do SVG is like kind of clunky. You have to transform it into actual React elements and everything, but there's this uh, React Native SVG transformer, which allows you to, as you can kind of see in my screenshot from their readme here, um, is that you can just kind of import this thing directly from an SVG file, and they just use it as a um, as an element and pass props to it, like color and width and height and things like this. So this is this is great for you know uh, icons and, and among other things. So uh, this is definitely one of my favorite tricks. It's worth knowing about if you don't already know. It works uh, really well with with Expo and with React Native that isn't Expo, but um, but not everything that is possible, like not all the cool transformers in the world are compatible with Expo, and this one is, which is great. And then the other thing worth mentioning is Lottie, uh, which is basically this thing from Airbnb that allows you to export Adobe After Effects animations into uh, this, this format, this kind of like JSON representation, and then you can render it both on web and on mobile. And so the, the Lottie renderer is built into Expo, which is totally cool because you can build these little, these like subtle, but, but um, useful, like, like it adds a lot of polish to your app when you build these subtle effects. Like on Twitter, when you like press the heart and these little animations happen, um, these tiny things make a big difference. They go a long way. And so um, if you aren't a user of Adobe After Effects, there's these uh, websites online that have tons of just content that's, that designers and, and people have built in Adobe After Effects and have been exported to Lottie. So it's become its own little ecosystem of stuff that you can download and use, which is great. Um, if there's any questions, um, I'm trying to kind of keep an eye on my chat over here, but um, let's see, uh, what do I have here? Uh, somebody asked, uh, oh yes, although I heard it was disabled for iOS by Apple, I didn't catch what that was in reference to. Um, it was three minutes ago. Anyway, um, and ra feel free to raise your hand. I'll try to keep an eye on my um, the hand raises as well. If you have any questions or thoughts. Number seven, so uh, 60 frame per second animations with reanimated, right? So uh, reanimated itself is not Expo specific, but I think it's something, because it's this native library, it's something that people didn't realize uh, you could use with Expo, right? 
And um, you might be asking yourself, what is reanimated? So 60 frame per second animations have been notoriously hard to do with React Native because you have this concept of like this bridge and you have to send these messages across the bridge, which, which incurs a uh, serialization and deserialization cost. Um, and so there's been a lot of effort over the years, uh, several iterations on trying to figure out how to describe animations in a declarative way so that you just send kind of the, the whole entire description of the animation across the bridge once and it gets executed super high speed on the native side, hardware accelerated, whatever. And so, uh, you know, we kind of got through these iterations over the years and uh, reanimated was, was by far the best sort of like, um, like most powerful and uh, not necessarily most easy to use, but most powerful implementation of this. And it was very native heavy had a learning curve to it. Uh, so it, it got adopted into Expo, which a lot of people don't realize, which unlocks a lot of really cool stuff. And then it has this kind of like big brother uh, gesture handler, which, which is a higher level API that allows you to do just a lot of swiping and, and gesture stuff, which is really cool um, in and of itself. So you combine those two, uh, amazing stuff as possible. And then on top of that, reanimated version two alpha just landed in Expo this week. Um, why is that significant? Uh, V2 was a complete rewrite to use this new mechanism that does not require this kind of costly bridge uh, uh, pass. So anyway, the API is totally different, um, mu much easier to learn, or, or so they say. So I, I would encourage you to get your hands dirty on this stuff. And uh, I would definitely also say that this stuff, uh, especially reanimated and gesture handler, do deserve an entire talk of their own. And so I don't want to dive super deep into this. But they are from somebody called uh, Kay Magiera, um, who is with Software Mansion. And so they have done some amazing work on this. Cool. Uh, got it. And then I just got the message that the previous thing was a reference to the QR code feature. So there is, uh, you can have QR code readers. Apple does allow QR code readers in apps, but there, it is very tightly regulated. So there, there are cases where you might get rejected for that. So you do have to be cautious about it. The built-in QR code reader of Expo, of the Expo client app was disabled. That doesn't mean that you can't build apps that use QR, QR code readers, right? Um, let's see. Someone asked me, does uh, the screen animation that I showed before, was it using reanimated? And I think the answer is yes. Yeah. With the shared element transitions, I assume you're referring to that one. And yes, I believe it was using reanimated. Number eight, uh, sign in with Apple. And this may seem like a mundane one compared to like fancy animations, but um, I think this is worth mentioning for a couple of reasons. One, um, you soon will be required to implement sign in with Apple if you're using any social sign in. And that, I don't know if that date has already passed or if it's still coming, but ultimately you should be doing sign in with Apple on the Apple platform. Uh, number two is that um, the really cool thing about this is you don't need to eject from Expo to make this happen. So it's built right in. It works uh, so well, both for, uh, like it is quite easy to implement as a developer, but it's also an incredible user experience. So I, I mean, for me as an Apple user, it has really changed the way that I kind of, like the, the, the pain associated with signing up for things in the past, I'm just like, oh, do I want to sign up for another account and think of a password and memorize it? No, I'm just going to not sign up for this service. Whereas like, since it, you know the friction or the barrier has been brought down so much that uh, that now I'm just like yeah this is this is way easy to do so I would encourage you if you have an app um, React Native or Expo to use this uh, like to implement this but the fact that it's baked into Expo I thought was really cool and worth mentioning because it's um, something that previously you would have had to eject to to do number nine. Uh, compile time branching. And so uh, the reason I bring this up is because, you know, as Expo supports more platforms, you really do have to kind of think about uh, supporting, okay, you know, am I going to have the same experience on Electron as I am on iOS, as I am on web, as I am on, you know, whatever other Surface like Xbox or whatever, right? Um, uh, Expo doesn't support Xbox, but uh, but React Native does. And so the, the, the thought pattern here is that you need a way to do branching that isn't necessarily at runtime. And so the uh, sort of canonical way of doing that is this, uh, this sort of file extension system. And it, and it works really cleanly, it works pretty well, and there's a bunch of supported out-of-the-box extensions. So I can say, look, if, if I have a dot, like if the compiler sees a dot electron.js, it's gonna pull in that module, versus it, uh, if it's, uh, it's gonna pull in that module on Electron platform, but then on every other platform, it'll go with kind of the vanilla one that doesn't have the dot electron part in the file name. And so you can do it with dot web, so I can isolate just a particular behavior for dot web, for dot iOS, for dot Android. Dot uh, expo basically means like if you're gonna build a native native build in Xcode versus one that's in the managed workflow, so that works really well. And so the idea being that you can share 95% of your code nowadays uh, between these platforms, and um, or, or better depending on how, how 
uh, uh, clever you're getting with these things. And then just branch when you need to. And, and so you don't pay a penalty since this is a compile time construct, which is great. You don't pay a runtime cost for that. Um, but there's this other trick that I find really useful that I thought was worth mentioning. Um, and so that's, that's this concept that uh, I discovered recently as I was kind of trying to figure out how to do certain compile time uh, branching, which is that you can set an entry point. And normally that's done in your app.json file. And obviously with app.json, you can't really put logic in a JSON file. But there's this concept of app.config.js, which is relatively new in Expo. And so you can do this compile time branching even based on environment variables and decide which entry point uh, the build process will, will start with. And so what, what I've done, or at least one thing that I've learned, is you just set a very simple environment flag in your package.json here, sorry, environment variable, to flag the two different, so in this case, I'm, I'm doing start and start with storybook. And, um, and then in my config.js, just look at that environment variable and then have two completely different entry points. So in theory, you can have, and, and I've seen people do this, multiple different, like completely different apps in a single code base where, where you're looking at some initial parameter to figure out which one to get started with or to build. So anyway, I thought that was really cool, worth sharing. Um, number 10 is uh, that you can use the best parts of Expo without using Expo. And what I mean by that is this. We have a concept called unimodules. All of these all these things, these, these individual packages that we've been talking about, like your, your haptics and your you know, location services and your vector icons and all these different individual things that, that have been built by the Expo folks, that they put all these hard work into these individual modules, you don't need to be in the managed workflow, nor do you have to pull in this enormous Expo SDK to use them. You can now use all of these, in, these modules individually in a bare, plain React Native app um, and, and leverage all the, the great work that the ex Expo folks have been doing, even if there's some reason that you can't use the, the Expo ecosystem as a whole. Um, so I thought this was really worth mentioning because if you haven't touched Expo in a while, there was a time where you basically had these two choices. You would either be completely in the managed ecosystem, in which case you can't pull in other native modules, you can only use what's out of the box provided by Expo, or you'd be in this um, this situation where, where you can eject, but you have this heavy dependency on this one large SDK, which is basically you know, the, the entire uh, Expo client binary baked into your app, and that is no longer the case. So you can use these things individually in a bare React Native app, which is, uh, I thought, totally worth mentioning. Questions coming through says, uh, what is the best approach? Use managed Expo and eject, or use React Native and add Expo? I usually start with manage Expo and eject. Um, I think that if you're really trying to squeeze every last megabyte out, the second one where you actually start with a bare project and pull these individual uh, uh, components in might be uh, shave some uh, amount of megabytes off of your final uh, bundle size. Or I shouldn't say bundle size, but your client binary. But yeah, I, yeah, I, I don't know that there's a a better, but you, 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 there's some trade-offs. And ultimately, I think what's happening is the gap is closing, right? So the idea of ejecting at some point will be like uh, uh, identical to if you would have started a bare React Native app and pulled in the individual ones that you need. Yeah. So, um, right, so, so on that topic, basically this happened last year. Expo announced this major re-architecture that splits each module into a standalone package that can be used even in a non-Expo project. And um, what was interesting about that is that a lot of this unimodule stuff even got pulled in by Flutter, by, by like people who aren't even in the React ecosystem at all, were able to kind of leverage these uh, some of the architecture decisions or some of the like work they had done to. Uh, it, it was quite a challenge for, for them to to make things that are kind of standalone that were able to to uh, work without. Like, there's a whole dependency management piece of this. I'm not doing a great job of explaining this. There was a really good tech talk on it, um, but there is. Uh, but yeah, so, so a lot of the work has been used even outside of the React Native ecosystem. So uh, really cool stuff that's happening from the Expo team there. And then I, th I thought this was worth mentioning as well, which is that you know on the topic of using Expo without using Expo or getting some of the Expo features without using Expo, um, the idea that you can use Expo Web in a bare React. So there's really two points on this slide. Point number one, you can use Expo Web even a bare React Native project. So, so you have this React Native project, and now you want to support web, like mobile web or something, you know, without changing too much code. Um, you can actually pull in Expo Web um, and add it to your project without going full-blown into Expo world. And then 
to go one step even further. Now, I have used Web, Expo Web in just pure web projects, like web projects that are just like a desktop web page I've used Expo Web for because it just gives me so much awesome stuff out of the box. Um, you know, and, and granted, a lot of that is built on the hard work from Twitter, which who, who built React Native Web, um, but this has built even more stuff on top of that. So, so I really love it, uh, even for web. Um, and then I have this kind of runner up list. And so this is my, uh, these are kind of my, you know, asterisk like runners up here uh, that didn't make the top 10 list, but maybe should have, and maybe I didn't make the right choice on, on what those top 10 were. But uh, these are things that each, uh, that definitely deserve a mention, which is server side rendering, right? So there's this um, kind of next.js kind of expo integration, which is uh, kind of combines the work from the expo web team and uh, next, which comes out of the Zite, which I think has been renamed to Versal. Um, comes out of those uh, folks, and uh, you get the server side rendering stuff, which is really cool for uh, just kind of building websites using Expo Web. And then you've got this uh, Expo GL, which is kind of like this kind of Web GL inspired, or I think the API is modeled after Web GL. But you get this 3D kind of canvas that you can build. I've seen some really amazing stuff built on that. I had a demo that I was going to show, but it didn't, um, we didn't end up. It didn't end up making a cut into this. Uh, Presentation, but but if, if you look at what Shopify has done in just like with some of their 3D stuff in their shop app uh, using pure JavaScript, uh, you can see how powerful kind of that WebGL stuff is or ExpoGL in this case. Um, you can do background audio uh, that is still in its infancy in a sense, but yeah, you can like listen to music, like minimize your app, and you're still listening to it, um, you know, and and without ejecting Expo, which is really cool. There's the screen capture API. So if you've ever um, been using an app and you take a screen capture and then it kind of immediately pops up and it's like, hey, I noticed you took a screen capture. Would you like to share this with someone? Or it kind of tries to enhance that experience um, as well as just like detecting if someone took a screen capture. Um, and so I thought that was really neat. And then it can also, there's also this API for uh, programmatically taking a screen capture so that you could, let's say for, like the example that I just gave where you take a screen capture and it's like, hey, um, do you want to do something with this screenshot? Um, th that is often used in bug reporting. So you've got these beta testers, they took a screenshot, and then you're like, oh shoot, I bet he's trying to, he or she's trying to uh, report a bug. Um, why don't I pop up a little form where you can immediately just say, oh, the bug is X, and it'll send off the bug report with the screenshot. Um, of course, there are native libraries that do this as well, but the fact that this is doable completely within React Native now, uh, sorry, within Expo, and this is very new, I thought was, was, was worth a runner-up mention. Face detection, I haven't personally used it. I've seen some really cool demos. It's, it's available in Expo on both web and, uh, and mobile. The haptics was just a little like, you know, on iPhone 7 and newer, you got those little like very subtle haptic feedbacks, which I think is, is worth mentioning. Being able to do image manipulation on device before you send a really heavy image across the network. Um, and then there's like this printing API that I have never used, which I thought was really cool. So um, we haven't even, you know, like this stuff is even just beyond the scope of the, the 10 items that I picked, but I thought it was worth a mention. Um, anyway, so Expo unlocks a ton of exciting things uh, about mobile and web development and desktop development. And so thank you for listening. Uh, please do hit me with some questions and uh, find me online if you have any thoughts.